Hi, everyone, and welcome to Finding Mental Health Care in Washington State, Where to Start. My name is Leah Erickson, and I am the case manager with the Crisis Care Clinic at Seattle Children's, and our other class leader is? My name is Chelsea Noble. I am a family advocate case manager for the Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine Unit care team. A few things of note before we begin. First, um, this class is not going to cover resources at Seattle Children's Hospital, so we will be focusing on how to access care in the community. Additionally, uh, while we are case managers, um, our time is available to you during this class, and we are not able to offer case management services outside of the class time. Um, welcome. So our goal today is really to give you all a baseline understanding um, of the tools and skills you'll need to access care for your children in Washington State. Um, a few things just to be aware of as we're going through all of this information. Um, one of the reasons actually why we're doing this class is because we know that information about how to access care in Washington does not all live in one place. So it can actually be pretty difficult to find um, out how to, how to seek care. Um, and then additionally, we are seeing a higher need for services really than ever before. And so a lot of families are experiencing barriers in accessing care when they need it um, and are also often waiting for services. Um, so we call this out today not to start on a negative note, but really because I think acknowledging the, the barriers in our system can actually really empower and educate you on how to, how to move forward and really to understand that if you are struggling or you are waiting for services or therapists aren't calling you back, you're likely not doing anything wrong. Um, and I think just awareness of that uh, can be really helpful through the process. Our agenda for today is to define uh, the different levels of care in Washington state. So we'll go over outpatient mental health services in addition to intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization and residential. We're gonna dive into how you seek care um, uh, through each of those pathways um, and the things you need to pay attention to uh, in order to look for services. We'll also touch on crisis services at the end and what to do if your child is experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, this diagram is going to guide our conversation today. Um, so it, it um, at the bottom here, we start with what's called the lowest level of care. Um, when I say level of care, really what I mean is the amount of support that you're getting within your treatment program. So the outpatient treatment here at the bottom is the lowest level of, of care or lowest level of support. And then as you move up words on this triangle, um, the amount of support provided in each of those treatment programs increases. Um, be mindful that not all children need all of these levels of care. And as we go through the, the uh, talk today, um, our goal is to help educate you on what each service provides to help you know what care might be most appropriate for your child. We can't really talk about accessing care without an, uh, an understanding of consent for care. So first, um, it's important to know that each state uh, in the US has their own age um, in, uh, by which a, a minor may consent to mental health treatment. In Washington state, at the age of 13, a minor gains the right to consent for their mental health treatment, which also means that they, are, um, they own the right to consent to the release of their mental health information as well. Um, with that, regardless of whether or not your child has consented to release information to you as a parent, there are some things that a provider has to share with you or is required by law to inform you of. That includes safety concerns. So if your child is a risk to themselves or anyone else, um, the provider is going to inform you of that. They're going to include you in making a plan uh, for your child to stay safe 
They can share information about diagnoses and recommendations for treatment um, and progress as well, really so that as a parent or caregiver, you have the tools that you need to support your child um, through uh, their mental health services. We have a flyer here at the bottom, Teens and Privacy Rights. It's posted on our webpage um, that dives a little deeper into this information. Be mindful as we go throughout uh, the slides that this gray bar will indicate if there's a flyer that has more details about the topic we're covering. And all of those uh, flyers are posted on our webpage or will be soon. So let's start at the bottom of our triangle at the lowest level of care, which is outpatient mental health resources. First, to define outpatient treatment, um, that, is, that typically consists of one to two therapy appointments per week. Um, when I say therapy, this typically means your child is going into an office or meeting over video with a therapist that's going to talk with them about their problems or their, their concerns. Um, it may also include one to two visits a month with a medication prescriber. The frequency of appointments uh, really is gonna depend on your child's level of need and will be determined in partnership with the provider that you're working with. Um, therapy and medication management uh, can be provided by a variety of different providers um, with different licenses. The choosing a mental health provider uh, flyer goes through each of these um, providers in a little bit more detail, but I'll call out that uh, therapy can be provided by a licensed master's level therapist or a clinical psychologist. And psychiatric medications can be prescribed by your primary care provider, an advanced practice provider, or a psychiatrist. I think um, a, a common misconception about uh, accessing psychiatric medications is that a psychiatrist has to prescribe those. And um, access to child psychiatrists in our community can, can be quite limited. So I think it's helpful to know that there are a variety of providers you can go to. And I do wanna highlight ARNPs or psychiatric nurse practitioners. Um, they do have specialized training in prescribing psychiatric meds. And in addition, there are more of them available in our state than there are child psychiatrists. So it's a really good option if you're looking for specialized support around psychiatric meds. Um, Additionally, there is some varying comfortability uh, with primary care providers in prescribing psychiatric medication. So uh, one helpful resource uh, that is available through Seattle Children's is the PAL line, which is a resource for, excuse me, for primary care providers to call a psychiatrist at Children's and uh, get some guidance on what psychiatric medications to prescribe for a youth or family that they're supporting. Um, this is not available to families directly. Uh, so as a parent or caregiver, you can't call, but it's helpful to know in case you are seeking psychiatric medication, you go to your primary care, you sense a little hesitancy, I think it's helpful to, to let them know about this resource. Um, because this may then help you get started with psychiatric medications if that primary care can get some support around what to prescribe. Um, so what, what, do you, what do you look for when you start seeking um, services with a therapist? First, if you are looking for care for your child, you wanna confirm that the provider has specialized training to work with children and adolescents. Be mindful that associate providers, so providers that have graduated school but are not fully licensed yet, are still can be a good option. They often do have training to work with children and adolescents, and they are supervised by a fully licensed provider. So I think um, it, it opens up the options that you have um, if you're willing to look into associate providers. Additionally, with the consent for care laws in Washington State, uh, each provider really um, has their own kind of process uh, for including parents in treatment. So if that is something that's important to you in your child's care, that's a really good question to ask um, before scheduling. 
We also really emphasize the importance of evidence-based treatment and the flyer, the choosing a mental health provider flyer goes in detail, the different types of evidence-based treatment um, for different presenting concerns. But really what that means is that it's a form of treatment that has been tried and proven through research to work for this presenting concern. It usually uses standardized measures to make diagnoses and show progress in treatment, and also typically starts with an evaluation to guide treatment plan. One other thing to be mindful of, uh, and will depend on your child's needs, um, but if your child is maybe participating in weekly therapy, and they maybe have concerns in between appointments, you likely want to ensure that the provider you're working with has a coverage plan while they're away. And I would say that oftentimes providers that maybe work solo in a, in a private practice um, may have less supports for that than a provider that works within an agency or an office that has many providers. So um, depending on your child's frequency of appointments and level of need, that may be also something you wanna ask about prior to starting services. Uh, so in order to get your search started, uh, there are a few things you want to pay attention to, and one of those things is insurance, um, in addition to location, so where you live. There are two primary pathways for accessing mental health services um, that are kind of determined based upon what insurance you have. So if you have a Medicaid or state insurance plan, you are typically going to access care through what's called a behavioral health agency. And then there is a limited access to private providers outside of behavioral health agencies that may contract with your Medicaid plan. If you have a commercial or private insurance plan, your pathway is going to look a little bit different. You will use some search tools to yield a list of in-network providers, and then you would reach out to each of those providers directly to inquire about services. While insurance uh, is going to guide your search, please know that you are not required to access care through your insurance plan. So you would want to follow these pathways if you want your services covered by your insurance, but there are also providers in our community that um, offer care on like a private pay basis. So you would pay at, you know, at the beginning of each visit, whatever their rate is. Some insurance plans also have out-of-network benefits, so they cover a percentage of your care um, with a provider that's not in network. So if you're seeking care outside of your insurance network, it's really good to ask about whether you have benefits for that. And then lastly, some providers in our community also offer what's called a sliding scale or reduced fee service. Um, what that means is they would work with you to come up up with a financially reasonable plan to pay for services that's at a reduced rate than what they typically charge. So let's dive in a little bit deeper uh, into how to, or a little bit deeper into how to access care if you have a Medicaid or state insurance plan. Within your Medicaid plan, you most likely also have what's called a managed care organization or an MCO. Your MCO is essentially the specific plan within your Medicaid insurance that covers substance use and mental health services. Uh, this is similar to a private or uh, commercial insurance plan like Primera or Regents. Those uh, Primera, is the payer. And then under Primera, you're also going to have a specific plan, maybe Microsoft or Heritage or Federal that, that outlines the, the benefits within your plan. So up here under in the gray box under health plans offered, Amerigroup, Coordinated Care, Molina, those are all to Medicaid what a Microsoft or Federal plan is to Primera. Um, and the reason why this is important to know about is that not each region in Washington state uh, 
is contracted with behavioral health agencies. Um, the Medicaid plan is contracted with these behavioral health agencies to provide mental health services. But these behavioral health agencies have specific partnerships with these plans. And not all regions are um, cover all plans. So for example, if you look at this um, green center section, uh, North Central, you can see that within that region, the behavioral health agencies there are in network with Amerigroup, Coordinated Care, Community Health Plan, and Molina. But you'll notice that United Healthcare is not listed. So that means that none of the agencies in that region are in network with the United Healthcare Plan. So that speaks to why you, you often cannot cross region lines to access care, because if you, if you live in this orange section, North Sound, or Brown section, King County, and you have a United Healthcare plan, none of the agencies over here in North Central are going to be covered. So it's not only important to uh, access care through the behavioral health agency because you have Medicaid, but also to stay within your region um, to ensure that services are covered for you. So how do you find a behavioral health agency? The Department of Health website has a full uh, list or directory of agencies in Washington state. It's divided up by county. I will say that it doesn't necessarily note things like serves children or only serves adults. So as you go through that list, it's important to visit the websites and confirm that that agency does provide services to children and youth. Additionally, each MCO, um, so Amerigroup, Community Health Plan, so on, they all have a insurance website that will allow you to search for in-network services. So you can visit your insurance website and yield a list of covered providers, which will include agencies in addition to private providers outside of agencies that contract with that MCO. Once you've picked an agency, the first step is typically to schedule what's called an intake. Intake is a synonym um, for admission uh, or essentially just a start or beginning of service. Different agencies and counties have, have varying processes for enrolling in mental health services. Um, the, the process is always to start with an intake, but there may be some nuances within that process, like some agencies are gonna have you fill out forms prior to the appointment, others may have you do it at the appointment. Um, most of, of the agencies um, will not have you meet with your ongoing provider uh, for the intake appointment. Few will, but, but typically the goal of that appointment is to gather information about what you need uh, in order to pair you with a provider that's going to be well suited to support those needs. Um, so that actually is, it kind of speaks to why those appointments are so long as well. Um, do, do plan for those to be about two or three hours because they're essentially doing like a full assessment of what's going on to help make sure that they're gonna partner you with a provider that can support you. Um, this intake appointment is a really good time also to advocate for what you're looking for. So if your child has any preferences for their care or you have preferences for your child's care, even if it's something like the gender of the provider, the intake appointment is where you wanna communicate those needs and preferences because that information will then be factored into who they pair you with. So there are a few things to keep in mind when you're trying to choose a behavioral health agency. Uh, the first thing I wanna call out there is um, if you're aware that your child may need services in addition to just basic outpatient therapy, you likely want to ensure that those services are available through the specific agency you're interested in, because while all agencies are contracted with the state to provide mental health services, there is some variability as to what specifically is accessible within each agency. Um, and then 
Some programs also, or excuse me, some agencies also offer care in languages other than English. So if your family or child uh, has a, a primary language other than English, that may impact your decision uh, for which agency to go to. Some agencies also have more specific focus on different presenting concerns. And so that may contribute to the decision of what agency to proceed with. And then aside from that, really where you live, um, location and preference is, is kind of uh, the, what you're thinking about in terms of how to choose. We always suggest staying with, with a resource that's closer to home because that's gonna eliminate um, barriers in the future. You know, Traveling a far distance for appointments for a, a long period of time can be really difficult. So we usually suggest kind of starting close to you um, with the agencies closest to your home and working your way out um, if the agencies close to you don't offer the services that you need. And then I think this, uh, the next kind of points really highlight the benefit of receiving care through a behavioral health agency and why that's the primary pathway when you have Medicaid. When you're enrolled in a BHA, that agency then becomes your go-to for connection to services. So in Washington state, you actually have to be enrolled in a BHA in order to access the other services available within that agency. So things like medication management or groups. Um, when you have a therapist outside of a BHA, they cannot refer you to services in an agency. And when you're out, uh, when you're receiving care by a private therapist outside of an agency, um, you can, you can often find resources for therapy that's in network. However, when you start looking at psychiatric medication management or groups, there are sometimes no in network services for those things, um, depending on what region you live in. And so I think it's important to be mindful that if you know your child is going to need something other than just therapy, your best course of action is really to access care through a behavioral health agency to ensure you can also access the additional resources that you need. Um, I, one last note here about Medicaid is that some MCOs also have access to case management services. So you could actually get connected with an insurance case manager that can provide you with a list or guidance on how to seek in-network services. Um, and the best way to inquire about whether that's available to you is by calling the number on the back of your card. Okay, let's transition from Medicaid to how to access care through commercial or private insurance. Uh, Commercial or private insurance, some examples of those would be things like Primera, Regents, Cigna, Aetna. These are insurance plans that you either pay for um, privately on your own or are funded through your employer. Uh, when you have a private insurance plan, there are a few specific search tools um, that you can use to locate providers. So we're going to talk about those, uh, Psychology Today and Insurance Website. Uh, websites. Uh, we will also provide a little bit more detail about what insurance case managers can do. We're going to talk about Kaiser because Kaiser is a little bit of a, has, they have their own process. Um, and then we'll highlight two additional resources, uh, how to access multicultural counselors and the mental health referral service through Seattle Children's. So the first search tool that I typically use when I'm supporting a family with private insurance is Psychology Today. This is a public search engine that can be used to find therapists, psychiatrists, programs, and groups. I would say that is most effective in searching for therapists and psychiatrists and le less helpful when you're looking for programs or groups. The reason why Psychology Today uh, is so helpful in looking for providers is uh, all of the filters that you can use. So you can actually put in your zip code, you can put in um, the age of your child, the insurance plan,
plan that you have, and then even specific uh, presenting concerns or diagnoses um, that you're hoping that the provider can treat. And then the, the search is gonna yield providers that match all of the filters you've selected. Keep in mind, um, so excuse me, I'm gonna back up a second. Each provider that's listed on psychology today uh, is gonna have a profile that describes what they offer. Keep in mind that people are not always great at uh, updating information in multiple locations. So a lot of providers link their website to their Psychology Today profile under their photo. And I always suggest visiting the website if that's available because I found that contact information, availability information is often most up to date on the provider's personal web page. Um, I'm gonna transition to insurance websites and then I'll really highlight how we kind of use them in partnership with each other. So insurance websites also allow you to search for providers in network. It's gonna yield a search similar to what you're gonna look at on psychology today. The main differences um, in my experience is, is that there are often less filters that you can use on insurance websites. So sometimes you can't even filter by age. And so you're as you're looking, you're having to weed through adult providers um, and, and kind of spending a lot of time on really just being able to pick out who might be an option. So that's why psychology today, I think is a little bit better to start with because you're doing less weeding out of providers that are not gonna be a good fit because of all of the filters you have available to you. Um, the way that I use them in partnership with each other is typically to start on psychology today. You can pick your insurance payer. So you can choose Primera, you can even choose the Medicaid plans, you can choose Cigna, but you, it doesn't account for the specific plan you have under any of those insurances. So it's good to start the search on psychology today and then maybe verify on your insurance website whether that provider is in fact in network with your plan. Another downside of insurance websites that just highlights why I stick to psychology today is that it doesn't always account for different processes and accessing care. So for example, if you pull up a search on Primera, a number of Seattle Children's providers are gonna pop up on there, but Seattle Children's has a really specific referral process and you can't actually reach out to each of those providers independently. So that, and there's gonna be other offices like that as well, where you can't contact the provider directly. So I think it's helpful for looking at who is in network and not as helpful for really paring down your search to be providers that are going to be accessible and a good fit for your child. So insurance case managers, um, we talked so briefly about this with Medicaid, but there are a number of private insurance plans that also have this available. The best way to find out is by calling the number on the back of your card and just asking if it's available to you. Uh, insurance case management can look different uh, based upon your insurance plan. So some may offer more of like a care coordination line or team where when you call, you'll talk with somebody different each time. Others will actually assign you a specific case manager who's your point person that you can continue to reach out to with questions. So be mindful that while case management may be available to you, it may look different um, based upon what insurance you have. Insurance case managers, the most helpful thing that they can do um, is help you look at in-network resources. They can yield lists of in-network providers. And then they're also especially helpful um, at looking into services outside of outpatient mental health care. So Chelsea will highlight that a little bit later in our presentation, but I do just wanna call out that that's something that they're super helpful with as well. Okay, Kaiser, like I mentioned, is a little bit different than everybody else. They offer an integrated managed care uh, model, which means that they aim to offer all care under one roof. This can be sometimes limiting uh, for accessing mental health services. 
they've seen an increased need like everyone else during the pandemic, and they've had a harder time providing weekly therapy. So they're also um, often authorizing providers outside of their network. But I think the most important takeaway is that the first step, if you have Kaiser, is to call the Kaiser Behavioral Health Number. They have insurance case managers, which they call care coordinators. It's essentially a care coordinator line. And they are going to be able to either schedule you with a provider at Kaiser or provide you with resources to look outside of Kaiser if you need to. Um, and the uh, this is kind of a, an additional resource or additional provider search tool if you want to look into therapy services um, or specific therapists that understand um, various cultures or speak different languages. So the therapists listed on this search engine um, typically have a variety of different backgrounds, experiences, ethnicities, and language skills um, to support families that have a various cultural backgrounds. So if you're a, a family that speaks a language other than English or um, it's important to you that your provider has a little bit more knowledge about your cultural background or ethnicity. This is a really good option for looking at providers that are going to be well suited um, to match that need. And then the last thing that we're going to touch on before transitioning to higher levels of care is the mental health referral service. So this is the one resource uh, at Seattle Children's that we are going to share with you today. Uh, this is not a case management team. This team does provider searches for families. So they support youth 17 and under in getting connected to outpatient therapy, psychiatry, and evaluation resources. So um, they don't connect families with uh, care at Seattle Children's. They look into resources in the community. They're going to gather information from you either on the uh, through their intake form on their webpage or by calling you on the phone. And then they're going to look for providers that match what you're seeking and send you referrals when they have confirmed availability. Um, again, I wanna emphasize that this is case, not case management support. So really their, their support to you is in the initial phone call and then yielding the, the referrals at the end. Keep in mind um, that this resource has also seen an increase of uh, kind of traffic during the pandemic. So we really encourage you to use this resource if you need, but also continue to look for services by using some of the tools we're, we're talking about in this class while you're waiting um, for support from the referral service. And we have a flyer on our webpage posted um, that provides more details uh, about what they offer as well. Okay, I'm gonna hand it off uh, to Chelsea to start talking about some of our higher levels of care. Thanks, Leah. All right, so let's dive into when, uh, when it's time to seek an increased level of care and what those level of cares look like. So um, there are a couple different levels of care that are more intensive than outpatient support that we will cover today. Um, one of those is going to be what we call the King County Mid Wraparound and Wraparound with Intensive Services, also known as the WISE program. We will also cover intensive outpatient programs and partial hospitalization programs. Um, and then finally, we'll cover residential treatment. Um, and at the very end, we will have Leah cover uh, uh, information on crisis services. So, um, before diving into these levels of care, something I should mention that Leah already mentioned and I want to really highlight is that not all of these levels of care are going to be needed. Not all kids are going to need this higher level of care. Um, there's a lot of discussion that goes into, you know, when it's time to refer to these higher levels of care. Um, that's typically with the family and, you know, the child, if they already do have an outpatient team or are seeing a, a primary care physician, these are all discussions to continue having. Um, because these are more intensive levels of care and require some um, really good conversation and consideration. Um, one level higher than outpatient therapy that is uh, a 
community resource is Wraparound with Intensive Services. And this is for Medicaid eligible youth ages 20 and younger who would benefit from just that higher level of care of basic outpatient weekly therapy. Um, and this is especially the case when you, you know, feel like outpatient weekly therapy just in and of itself isn't really helpful and some more support is needed in the home. Um, and we don't want to, or families are not wanting to send their kiddo um, out to a, a, an agency or a service that's outside of their home. Um, these services are subject to availability by county. And essentially this is kind of wrapped up in your MCO and the uh, BHAs that uh, Leah was talking about earlier. Um, and so what this team would look like is it consists of a counselor, a medication management provider, um, one really wonderful resource and part of this team that I always love to highlight is teen and parent partners that are available to families 24 seven and care coordinators that can meet in the home or other suitable location. So oftentimes this means scheduling like a weekly meeting with this entire team to talk about the needs of the family. Um, and the wonderful part about this service is that it offers 24 seven crisis services and peer support. So these people are really your go-to team um, um, in the home providing you support and you're not only for your kiddo, but for your family as well. Um, really anyone can refer by calling an agency um, in their county um, and we'll have a link to um, a chart of those agencies by county on our website. Um, with, within the Healthcare Authority website, it'll give you, um, you know, based on your location, your county, um, what uh, agency would be appropriate for you. And then um, what happens at the very beginning of this process is what we call a CANS screening, Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths Tool to assess whether or not your child and family would benefit from this type of program. So something very similar to WISE, but um, that is actually eligible, uh, is available for non-Medicaid eligible youth is the King County Mid Wraparound Program. Um, so this is only for non-Medicaid youth who reside in King County that are under the age of 21. So not for Medicaid, this is for specifically families in King County, just wanna make sure I highlight that, um, who are not insured by Medicaid. And this is very, very similar to WISE in the sense that it comes with a team of supports, um, but the only difference really is that your team is not going to, uh, is not going to have a counselor. Um, prior to enrolling in this service, you have to already be established with a therapist. And so then the rest of that team kind of comes in uh, once they get connected with the mid wraparound program. Youth that in, are enrolled in this program or maybe are families who are thinking about enrolling their child in this program, um, they typically have youth that have some concerning behaviors at home, in the school, community, and they have to be involved in at least two levels of, uh, the, of services, typically mental health therapy, so already having been established with a therapist, um, substance use treatment, your, your child can also be already enrolled in like uh, special education. So you have an IEP at school, um, juvenile justice system, or they can also be enrolled in developmental disabilities administration or DDA services in order to qualify for this particular program. So at least two of those in order to be qualified. Um, there will be a referral form linked um, on our website and or you can um, uh, and you can fax that to the phone number that's on the screen. Pretty easy process. All right, so going up that triangle that uh, Leah beautifully pictured for us earlier, are uh, intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization programs. And we're gonna talk about these in tandem because they are very similar um, in terms of what is involved. It's just the kind of scheduling and the level of intensity and the amount of time uh, commitment for each of these programs. So what are these services? It's a step up in outpatient level of care or a step down if your uh, child's coming from an inpatient hospitalization, like our PBMU here at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, or coming down from residential treatment and feeling like we're not ready to go just straight into weekly therapy. They need some additional supports, but they don't require that really, really intensive inpatient treatment anymore. They can step down to this level of care. 
Um, so these levels of care are often recommended, again, following an inpatient hospitalization, um, or if they have, it, kids have needs that just can't be managed by an outpatient therapist and they really need that increased level of, of support. Um, and also if your child goes to the emergency department, and we'll talk more about what an emergency department visit looks like later, if you do bring your kiddo to an emergency department, um, they will do an evaluation and maybe, um, you know, when they talk about kind of a plan for leaving the emergency department, they might recommend this level of care. And this will typically, you know, the program involves a lot of different people. It's a really big team of people all within one program. Um, you'll have, your child will have an individual therapist, a group therapist. There will also be family sessions, which is a really wonderful aspect of these programs. And they will also offer case management and connection to outpatient resource. So once they go through this program and they're getting ready to discharge, they will have case managers to help talk about the next steps after discharge, which will be your case management and the uh, treatment team. They also have medication management in collaboration with your outpatient team. Um, so if you've kind of, you know, throughout the program, if you've started to identify an outpatient therapist and continue to see your kiddo, once they're done with the program, the team of, you know, the medication management provider and the mental health therapist will coordinate with the outpatient team to make sure there is that continuity of care. So as far as what these programs look like, uh, this is where the difference between the two programs really comes into play. Um, the great thing about these programs is that you're not sending your child off to this agency in this building and they're there 24 seven, they get to come home at the end of the day and attend the program. It ranges for IOPs, sometimes it can be um, you know, a couple days a week, maybe two to three days a week. And then for partial hospitalization, that next level up above IOP would be more like maybe four, five, six days a week. So just that extra level of intensity. Um, IOPs typically run about three to four hours a day and a couple of days a week, like I mentioned. PHP is a little bit more intensive. I kind of like to think of it as like going to school. You start in the morning and then you leave in the afternoon or maybe uh, like, a, you know, kind of early evening. So six to eight hours a day um, up to probably five or six days a week. Each program is different in terms of their schedule. So I would highly recommend when you identify a program you're interested in, calling the program directly and asking about what their schedule looks like so that you can, you can kind of decide, especially because you're driving to these programs, some of them will be virtual and that's also something to make sure to, to ask about. But if they are in person to make sure that, you know, because they're a little bit more intensive requiring going multiple days a week, make sure that it's in a location that works for you. Um, and these were just, uh, that image is just a couple of ideas of what, you know, a couple of examples of what the, uh, the schedule might look like. But again, call the programs to, to ask. And then a lot of the programs, what's wonderful about these higher levels of care, um, and especially the ones that are available to us in Washington state are that they are focused typically on a specific diagnosis. So for example, um, if a child is diagnosed with anxiety disorder, we have programs that are typically geared towards that, that particular diagnosis or um, obsessive compulsive disorder. They have a program that has that particular, you know, focuses on that particular diagnosis as well. How do you apply to these programs? Um, so again, my, my number one recommendation, regardless of whether you're just kind of thinking about it or you're ready to apply, um, reach out to the program and really, you know, ask your questions, see if this is the right program for you. And then if you're ready to apply, you think this is a great program, you can simply call and you can express that you're interested and wanna get started in the process. Um, families often say, I don't really know what to ask these programs. This is new to me, or you know, this is a lot to take in. How, what do I ask? You know, this mental health is new to me. Um, the best place to start is say, well, what questions do other families typically ask? And they have a wide range of questions that they're asked on a daily basis. And so they'll be able to answer a lot of your questions. Um, some things to keep in mind are the distance. Um, again, like I mentioned, these programs, some of them are virtual. Um, the, the more often not than not the IOPs right now, just because of COVID are virtual, but that is ever evolving. And so that's something to ask when you call these programs is, are you offering virtual or are you offering in person? 
is there an option to do virtual if you are offering in person? Um, so, but for the PHP programs, because they're more intensive, a lot of the times they're in person. Um, and so just thinking about the distance that you have to travel to get your kiddo there. Uh, financial supports, inquire with your insurance about the programs that are listed within your insurance plan specifically. So like Leah mentioned, calling your insurance case manager or asking for an insurance case manager, they are a wonderful resource to begin your search and finding this particular level of care. Um, because there are fewer of them in Washington state than there are outpatient therapists, they can really narrow down your search to a program that's gonna work for you. Um, a lot of the time when you think of a higher level of care going multiple times a day, like I said, it's kind of like going to school for the PHP programs. There's a concern for, well, what if, if they don't go to school and they go to this program, what's going to happen with their education? Great question. I would say ask the program, talk about the concerns that you have, and they'll likely have some creative ways to make sure that your child is um, you know, not falling behind in school. Um, and again, like I mentioned, telehealth versus in person, a lot of the IOP programs are virtual. They have some wonderful, uh, just primarily virtual IOP programs here in Washington state. Um, but you know, this is just another question to ask when you call the agencies. And then we also have a flyer that's gonna be on our website that talks more about um, the different IOP and PHP community options that we have. All right. One more step up in our triangle, the very, very top level of care, seeking residential treatment. This is the um, highest level of, of mental health care that you can look for. And there's a couple different ways uh, that this can look for, uh, you know, just depending on your insurance and depending on, um, you know, where you want to go. And we'll dive into that. So what is residential treatment? Residential treatment is a long-term placement option or treatment for youth who cannot safely return home um, or to their community. Um, you know, this is just something that I think, well, again, kind of going into the conversations with your community providers, if you do have them already, but just a conversation as a family to have and, and weighing the pros and cons about, you know, can we keep this kiddo safely at home and, in, and at school, um, having those conversations? Um, and then this would be the long-term placement. If we've kind of tried all those levels of care that we talked about earlier up until this point, and they're just not really doing the trick, residential would be an option to consider. And they typically last anywhere from one to two months to two years. That is a very, very wide range. It really depends on so many different things. Um, it depends on insurance first and foremost. How long will your insurance cover this program? Um, that, is a, that is definitely a conversation that the facility you identify and the insurance company will have to see what's going to be the best situation, how long can they cover? And then with that, it's gonna depend on if this is medically necessary. So they'll kind of do a continual, you know, if your kiddo does go to a residential level of care, they'll continuously, you know, the treatment team will talk to your insurance company to say, here's where this kiddo is at. Um, we still think that it's medically necessary for them to stay. Let's extend, you know, can you cover them for an additional month? And they will have that conversation. Um, and again, it, that also depends on the progress that they make in treatment. So, um, do we feel like they need to stay for a couple more weeks? You know, they're, they're, they're doing okay, but they, they still need some extra time. And, and also it takes some time for them to get really um, comfortable in the program and comfortable with their treatment team. So that plays a role as well. There are uh, lots of different kinds of treatment programs available. Um, there are diagnosis specific treatment, like if your kiddo is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder or an intellectual disability, um, eating disorder treatment, substance use and co-occurring substance use and mental health treatment. Um, there also are general mental health programs. And um, this is like they treat patients with a variety of mental health concerns and diagnoses. Um, within Washington state, we don't have very many. Um, a lot of the specialized treatment programs like the autism specific treatments um, are more than likely going to be outside of the state of Washington. But again, talk to your insurance company to see, you know, let them know that you're looking for residential treatment. Here are my kiddos diagnoses. What do we have access to under our insurance plan? Um, so that's just, again, a conversation to continue having with your insurance company and your family as to what's doable if they are outside of Washington state. 
All right, so very similar to IOP and PHP, residential treatment is just the more intensive level of that, right? You have your individual therapy, you have your group therapy, you still have family sessions. And I will say, even if the treatment program is outside of Washington state, treatment programs are doing a wonderful job of really including families still in the family sessions by doing Zoom, um, you know, some sort of virtual session with the families to keep you involved. They have medication management, so they'll be assigned a psychiatrist. Um, some of them will have recreational activities. Um, so that's something if that's really important to you and your child that, you know, maybe you want to have a program that offers equine therapy um, or swimming or camping. Um, these are things to consider um, if those are important to you. Um, some of them also do make time for academic learning because this is 24-7 treatment. They don't come home at the end of the day. They are there 24-7 for a long period of time. So that's also something to ask when you are talking to these programs. Um, and then some of them will have discharge planning. And the reason I say some is because in Washington State, um, they know the Washington State mental health care system. If you do have a residential treatment program that you're, you know, attending in Washington State, and so they'll more than likely be able to help you locate Washington State mental health providers. However, if you go out of state to a, you know, out of state facility, um, you know, a person in Texas might not know the Washington State mental health care system, and so they might not really be able to help you with discharge planning home. This is, again, where you utilize your insurance case manager. Um, having an insurance case manager on board and ready to help you locate the next uh, level of, of care for when they discharge from residential treatment is really key here. What does this referral and admission process look like? This is a really high level of care. It seems like it's a lot is involved. Um, this is can also be a self-referral. If you and your family feel like this level of care is necessary for your child, you can absolutely call the facility and just say, we're looking at this level of care. Um, you know, we definitely want to start the referral process. We feel like it's necessary or you can, if you're already connected with an outpatient mental health provider, um, that would be a really good time to bring the outpatient mental health provider in saying, I really think a, a, a residential level of care is needed. Um, can you please help me with the referral? And a lot of the times they'll help you do that. So just having that conversation with them. Um, and a lot of the residential facilities will ask for medical records specifically related to their mental health treatment. So any mental health treatment they've they've received any emergency department visits, they'll likely want to look at a lot of that. Um, and then once they have all that information, they will undergo what they call a clinical review and the facilities clinical team will do this. Um, they sometimes will like to do an assessment with you and your child directly, but not all the time. Again, a question to ask the facility. Um, and then once they get all of the information they need, they will reach out to you via phone when they have a decision. Um, the timing of that and how long it'll take to make the decision really varies depending on the facility and how many referrals they have. And then if your kiddo is clinically accepted, they will add them to a wait list for a bed. Um, and then once a bed becomes available, they're going to call you ahead of time and say, hey, we have a bed becoming available in X amount of days or X amount of weeks. Um, and then we're going to get started on the insurance pre-authorization process and contact your insurance company. Um, this is a very general overview of the admission process for residential facilities. Call the one that you're interested in and ask about what their process looks like because it, it in general is like this, but they might have some caveats here and there as to what is a part of their process. Okay, so with Medicaid specifically in Washington state, residential treatment is not covered under Medicaid insurance. For Medicaid families who are interested in residential level of care for their kiddos, we have what's called the Children's Long-Term Inpatient Program or CLIP. This is a Washington state run long-term treatment option and the most intensive form of psychiatric treatment offered for youth ages five to 18. Um, they have both a voluntary and involuntary referral pathways. And what that means is whether or not your child is voluntarily wanting to go to residential treatment or not. Um, the involuntary pathway involves a mental health court invoking what we call the Involuntary Treatment Act or ITA. Um, this is uh, a lot of information, and I think what's 
really what what's really helpful is connecting with um, if you especially if you have Medicaid, they have um, case managers for your insurance, your Medicaid plan. So for instance, if you have Community Health Plan of Washington, they have a clip case manager within your insurance company. More information and contact information for those case managers and about the CLIP program can be found on their website, clipadministration.org. It's a wonderfully easy uh, uh, website to navigate, and the CLIP liaisons are really helpful in getting you started on the process if you are interested um, in answering any questions that you have about the CLIP treatment program. Some suggestions just in general, this is you know, for residential levels of care or even IOP and PHPs. My first recommendation and number one recommendation is to call your insurance company and request a behavioral health case manager if they offer that, or just calling your insurance company and saying, I'm looking for residential treatment facilities for my child. Um, make sure that you've mentioned that it's for youth and not an adult. Um, and within Washington state, or if you're open to out of state, see what they can do to help you. Um, and then they can help you with that search. Um, also calling and visiting the facilities websites, do your research, ask your questions to see if this is going to be the best fit for your child before applying. And then while your child is in residential treatment, again, depending on the facility and their ability to do dispo planning, connecting with your insurance case manager um, or your insurance company in general to help create that plan for the next step is really uh, another uh, great suggestion. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Leah, who's gonna talk briefly about uh, crisis services. Okay, so first, what is a crisis? A uh, crisis can be a variety of different things. It can mean that your child is talking about hurting or killing themselves or talking about hurting or killing somebody else. It can look like your child harming themselves on purpose or harming others through verbal or physical aggression can be property destruction as well. Uh, it can also look like your child not able to is not able to care for themselves. So they're not doing the kind of typical day to day things um, like brushing your teeth, uh, going to school, getting enough sleep, maybe sleeping too much. Um, so they're not kind of participating in their daily life as usual. It can also uh, be a crisis if your child is not being forthcoming with you about how they're doing. So if they're at, if you're asking questions about if they're having any thoughts of wanting to harm or kill themselves and, and they're not sharing with you how they're doing, um, it's important to get that assessed by someone who, who can get them to engage in that conversation. Um, and then really at any point in time, if you are concerned or you feel like you cannot keep your child safe at home, that can be a crisis in itself. So what do you do um, if you're experiencing a, a crisis or your child is experiencing a mental health crisis? There are two flyers um, that are helpful during uh, to kind of provide more details about crisis services. One of them is the hotlines for youth. And the other is called getting help in a mental health crisis. Um, but to kind of sum both of those up, uh, there are crisis lines available nationally. And also uh, there is a specific crisis line for each county in Washington state that is open 24 seven and available to both youth and adults. Uh, some counties in Washington also have additional crisis services available. So, that means aside from just that crisis line, they could have a crisis response team that can assess your child's level of risk and do what's called safety planning with you, make a plan with you and your child to ensure your child's safety at home. You may also call 911 if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, and this would be in a scenario where your child requires an immediate response in order to stay safe, or you're not able to safely transport your child to an emergency department. And then if you are experiencing a crisis, please know that your nearest emergency room is an option for you to get support. Uh, we usually suggest the nearest emergency room just because uh, typically that's the safest plan, um, especially if your child may be struggling with wanting to go. 
Uh, and then depending on what's going on and the availability with your primary care, you can also reach out to your primary care provider to see if you can get an urgent visit to just kind of talk through what to do next. And then also know that if you are connected to any outpatient services, whether that be a therapist or a psychiatrist, um, it is appropriate uh, and okay to call them if you're experiencing a crisis as well, because they can help guide you through next steps. If your child is in a crisis that warrants an emergency department visit, um, there are a few things you can expect. Uh, the first is that you're gonna meet with a mental health evaluator. The goal of a mental health evaluator and really a mental health visit to the emergency room is to assess your child's level of risk, which means assessing um, what's going on, if they're having any plans to harm or kill themselves, and really um, navigate whether the concerns warrant a stay in an inpatient uh, facility in order to stay safe, or can they provide you some tools and education to be able to bring your child safely home. Their goal really is to try to get you home if they can um, with some additional resources because inpatient treatment is, uh, is kind of a very restrictive form of treatment. And so we wanna try other things before going that route, but that is available to families if it is necessary in, in order to keep your child safe. Um, the mental health evaluator is also going to do a safety plan with you and your child. So uh, this includes talking about what your child's stressors are, how to notice those as a parent or caregiver, and how to uh, change your environment or reduce access to things your child might be able to harm themselves with. They also provide coaching on disposition planning, so what resources might be available or helpful to you in the community for supports. And then if it's determined that an inpatient admission is needed to keep your child safe, the mental health evaluator is going to refer your child to facilities in Washington State. Uh, keep in mind that uh, there are facilities, inpatient facilities, that do accept parent referrals. So it's not always necessary to bring your child to an emergency department if, you're, if you think they may need inpatient treatment. There are some facilities that accept uh, parent referrals. Uh, so you can call in as a parent from home to describe what's going on and see if that might be a helpful resource for your child. Okay, uh, just to wrap things up, uh, we wanna acknowledge that this has been a lot of information that we've provided you today and really highlight again that the journey of finding mental health services can be a marathon. It can be exhausting, it can be really hard. And so it's really important as a parent or caregiver to take care of yourself through this process. Because if you're not caring for yourself, it, it's especially hard to take care of somebody else. So we have uh, one more flyer uh, that we wanna share with you, which is resources for family mental health, um, which guides you in some supports available to you as a family um, or parent or caregiver to um, kind of help navigate uh, crises and mental health resources and just um, provide some extra support to you during your journey. And lastly, we just want to acknowledge all of the folks that participated in creating this class. Um, so thank you to all of our case managers listed here um, that supported creating the content for our course today. <laughs>